you know, they're not at home, they're not on Zoom, they're on the subway, they haven't had a choice. And I think we, you know, often we there is a sense of disconnect between those that don't have to do those jobs and those that do those jobs. Um, but that sense of disconnect is eradicated through COVID because, you know, I think as the deputy mayor said, we're in this together, right? It's a contagious disease. You can't help but be affected if your neighbor has COVID. You're going to have to change something about how you do lead your life. And I would hope that with the understanding, the greater understanding and appreciation for the work that so many people do outside of the home, on the front lines, our nurses, our social workers that are visiting, you know, clients, our police officers, our correction officers, fire, firemen, educators, I mean, the list goes on and on. People who work at food banks, like it, the, the greater appreciation for the value and, and essentials, the only real, you know, it's a really apt word, um, for their work will force us to understand the importance of making sure they have the support they need. And the support in, you know, my world often comes in transportation, but that's real. Like the way they get back and forth to work is real. It has to work, it has to be um, reliable, it has to be cost effective. And when those things stop working, before it was an inconvenience to that group and now it will it affects all of us we can see clearly how it affects all of us and i hope that there's a, a greater understanding and appreciation that people need to support some things that don't directly affect their daily lives so supporting robust transportation networks in neighborhoods that you never go to actually does help you in your daily life as well you have to acknowledge that now because it affects the people that are working to maintain this, you know, this, the strength of the city. Um, that I would hope does not change. I hope that we remember that and we continue to put that at the forefront. Um, I also believe that masks will no longer be thought of as an abnormal apparel item. They'll be pretty normal now. <laughs> Jordan. Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things that I think is crucial to keep in mind is that, you know, COVID-19 has really laid bare uh, and exacerbated a, a tremendous amount of problems that frankly already existed from affordability, accessibility. Obviously, there have been, you know, a tremendous number of public health you know, crises and problems and, and terrible things that have kind of come about. But I think one of the things that, you know, leaves me optimistic is that I think a lot of leaders who are, you know, decision makers, uh, executives in business, uh, high level leaders in government, you know, they have been and, and, and we have been confronted with with these crises, you know, kind of firsthand, you know, face to face, I think, you know, I think it was Mira and Gordon both kind of touched on the fact that, you know, there's historically been, you know, at times, at least somewhat of a distance between highest level leadership and kind of the day to day meat and potatoes of these crises. So it, it is my hope that, you know, the crisis that we, we find ourselves in and continue to remain in, you know, will really, you know, show folks that we really need to create opportunity at, at all levels of the food chain. Obviously, you know, that's not something that's, that's the case right now. And I think I'm, I'm heartened by some of the efforts uh, in, in the city and the state to kind of move in that direction. Um, but, but I think that, you know, the optimism on my end lies in the fact that, you know, leaders at all levels and citizens at all levels have been confronted with these problems and we're seeing some 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 things you know certain pieces of technology certain companies doing innovative things to bring down cost but i think just a, a, a forceful head-on confrontation with the problem um it is my hope that that will lead to constant uh, and continued attention to solutions and, and that really means, you know, collaboration between the public and private sectors. I think that's really, you know, the name of the game. I think the private sector, you know, needs to be held to, to an exceptionally high standard uh, in terms of, you know, being solutions oriented, adding value, doing good, uh, consumer protection. But I think the private sector absolutely needs to be engaged by government, you know, because they're just from a budget standpoint, uh, both the state and the city, you know, we're, we're in challenging times. So I think, you know, doing more with less resources and marshalling in higher power of the private sector in a responsible way is, is going to be increasingly important as I see it. So it, it sounds like the three of you are pretty optimistic about this. Uh, 
I will say though that let, let's just say there's no one else listening except just us talking. So we won't tell anyone what you say now, but I understand, I'm led to believe that sometimes government is a little like the battleship. It's really hard to make a quick turn, okay, or to stop doing something. Now, you're all people with expertise in government. How do we get government? What are the challenges and what do you think some of the ideas, how do we get government to move in this way? Because it seems that the private sector, uh, going back to my little uh, coercion thought here, uh, in order to survive, the private sector is, is adapting. Um, but the question is, how do we get government? I know there's a lot of barrier. How do we get government to move forward in ways that are not just more efficient, because everyone's in favor, but transformation. Transformation, which I know is always painful uh, and, and can be time consuming and costly. But how do we more rapidly, more efficiently transform? What thoughts on, on, on that? I can give a, a few thoughts. Um, most of the things that I think make a process slower in government are checkpoints that were put in place because of a bad thing that happened, right? So a bad thing happened, so we have to put in a policy to make sure that bad thing doesn't happen again. And so often you have a process that is sort of like a hodgepodge of different reactions to bad things that have happened over time. And each one in that moment was the right thing to do to, to, to sort of prevent a, 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 a crisis from happening again. Um, but when you're looking at it now, trying to sort of move quickly and respond to a health crisis, it's really sort of unhelpful and you can no longer find like the real motivation for why these things were put in in the first place. But the other part about government is its people, right? It's thousands and thousands of people going to work every day. Many of them spend, you know, 20, 30 years dedicating their life to public service and they have real vested interest and a real um, commitment to the work that they do. And they've been often through these different crises, so they know the history behind every different procedural check that's in place. So transformation in government for me starts with understanding what the goal is and explaining to everybody that's going to be part of that, how what it is, so that they become part of that transformation process. Um, I don't think that you, you, there are instances where you can impose quickly a sudden change on government, but really to get in a whole division, I mean, I think Gordon brought up the paper to online thing. That happens through explaining the goal, giving people the timeline, understanding why, and letting them be part of the process, and they're often the best source of transformational ideas. Um, you know, we had that at TLC, everybody, we had thousands and thousands of drivers coming on in unprecedented levels, everybody doing business on their phone, and that change had to happen, and quickly within weeks of getting people to do every licensing operation on their telephone. Um, and that change came from, you know, saying it must come and then the actual nuts and bolts coming from the line people who actually were the ones who came up with the, the transformational ideas. So I think it's overlooked, but people are the greatest asset in making those transformations and letting them understand the context and the reason why you need to get there is the fastest route for getting there. Jordan? Yeah, I think, you know, what I might say is I think that, you know, the two buzzwords as far as I'm concerned here are leadership and respect. Leadership, you know, when it comes from, I think it really, you know, cues are taken from the top. And I think leadership really, you know, I think Mira put it well, laying out a, a real strong, bold vision, be it on the sustainability front, being about how, you know, we're going to address, you know, a, a housing crisis, a food shortage crisis, a, you know, school reopening crisis, and just sort of laying out, you know, where we need to get and why to deliver fundamental services to people that they expect and, and frankly, deserve and really kind of setting a roadmap to get there, you know, kind of at a high level from the top and then, you know, respecting the people who do the work and, and really, you know, empowering them. I think, you know, the private sector is anything but perfect. I think one of the things that, you know, is sort of one factor that makes the private sector a bit more nimble uh, in a time of crisis like this, you know, perhaps is, is related a bit to sort of the, 
the lessening of, of red tape, you know, kind of in bureaucracy. I think, you know, we obviously need very strong guardrails to assure, you know, government is accountable to people and, and, and things like that. But I think it's really sort of setting a vision, getting broad buy-in, and then, you know, letting the professionals and the people who do their work best do their job. And I think at times of crisis, when, when good results are seen, that's really sort of the blueprint and, and, and the root roadmap as far as I've seen it. Um, you know, but I'm confident that, you know, people will, will demand results. And I'm confident that, you know, our leaders will rise to the occasion. I think it's just a matter of, again, you know, that, that clear vision and what is the, you know, kind of overarching thesis statement that, you know, every bit of work is, is laddering up to. I mean, Gordon, you're, you, you know, you're uh, at ground level there in governmental agency, and someone's going to say to you, but that's not how we used to do that. And I can do that efficiently. And at some point, someone's going to say, you maybe could have done that efficiently, but we don't operate that way anymore. And here's why. And let me sort of share with you the reasoning behind that, because this is, this is a new way we've transformed whatever process it might be. What do you think? I think one of the things that um, I think like what Mira have saying before is, uh, we, we should not underestimate people's capability to adopt. And also we should not across the board underestimate people's uh, knowledge on technology and willingness to adopt. I think, I mean, unfortunately we will take a crisis to bring all this good quality out. But I believe because I mean, technology is widespread. People are, everybody have smartphones. So in a way that a lot of these things people are doing on a day in day out basis. I mean, you know, the, the, just the smartphone itself is almost literally like a computer on your hand. And people got so used to doing it because everybody is on the phone. So you know, it make the transformation much easier. And also I think um, the strategy, you know, like what uh, Jordan is saying is we need to get feedback from the people who actually need to use this policy or new policy. So we did get a lot of feedback and the fact is because we have to ask the people. I mean, you know, we will say, you know, get rid of all the, all the paper and then people have questions. And as long as we're able to listen to the concern or maybe even some of them actually have excellent idea that we actually adopted some of them into our program. And I think that really the, 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 key, the key aspect. And I think through the exercise, all the management have now opened up their eye and seeing that, you know, as long as you are doing something that everybody going to benefit, people will adapt to it. So instead of like a top-down push of technology, we kind of have a collaboration by process. I mean, obviously it's a government, it, this is a government. So we're not going to really um, establish a process by, by voting, but at least with the collaboration, people will be more easily to adopt a new process that come in because they also get a side benefit out of it because instead of they have to work from home, so you know, some of them have technology or equipment limitation. I mean, you literally cannot give everybody a printer at home and ask them to go print a document and then somehow mail them. I mean, we could easily just change the method to say, you know what, from now on, everybody print from home and then we use an overnight mail and send paper around all over the place. I mean, that could be one way to adapt the process, but obviously we did not choose that because of, um, you know, of, the, of the crisis. So I think, as long as the technology is there and people have the willingness to be flexible, I think through the exercise, I think all, a lot of government become more flexible. I mean, from my point of view, I mean, you know, a lot of our sister agency, uh, they adopted the similar process. People actually work from home and, you know, they use whatever they can and business still go on. The business go on might not be as, uh, you know, efficient as before, but slowly we are bringing back the same level of efficiency. So this transformation is not only in our agency. We are much more small agency for us to adopt any protocols, much easier. But like all the big agency that we deal with, you know, DEP, DOB, you know, they're all in various states of uh, adaptation, even before the pandemic. And this just basically push it to the edge. And then, um, you know, I, I, I think it's, you know, unfortunately, you know, hopefully we don't need a, crisis again to continue the process. But I think with this transformation, everybody thinking will change and the process will continue. Well, I have, I have one last topic to raise you, but before I do that, I want to just turn to Mira for a second because you mentioned this a little bit earlier, but one of the things that, that has changed dramatically in the last six months is so much 
of transportation in our city. The push away from cars suddenly was almost instantly reversed. The waiting for congestion pricing and all that that's coming in doesn't seem to be coming in so soon. The sudden uh, uh, fear of being in subways and buses uh, after crime rates have been going down and then new concerns with homelessness playing a role in this too. I remember when the talk about using credit cards and taxi cabs was thought of as, oh my God, this will never work. It'll destroy the business. It will, no one will, it will be problematic. I think we're way past that with taxis, but you've had transformative work involved in transportation. How do you look at what's happening with, with, with the whole transportation sector? Because talk about disruption. Uh, there's an area of great, of great attention. What thoughts? Uh, it's a large question. <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the, the, the for hire and taxi industry over the last four years uh, changed, you know, basically week to week, month to month, you know, new passengers came on, new services came out, the agency had to adapt quickly. People adapted culturally. Whoever thought of sharing a ride with somebody you never met before, you know, but through algorithms that became very easy and acceptable. Um, that's since been reversed since COVID. Um, but, you know, I think the, the, the biggest, um, and you mentioned the credit cards, which is actually the key to one of the biggest key, the, the biggest factors in being able to be transformative and government to be able to balance that with societal needs. The credit cards, opened up the um, requirement that taxis provide GPS data about the trips to the city. Now, New York still stands as the only city that gets that level of data um, from the taxis. And we move that requirement over to the Ubers and the Lyfts and the Vias and every other for hire vehicle in about, you know, between 2015 and 2016. And that gives the city a really good picture of what's happening on the ground. Um, and we do get some information about subway trips and bus trips and some bike trips and maybe we'll get scooter trips when they start and revel trips. But what we don't have, and this is, you know, change will be, change is constant, it will keep happening. But what we don't have, um, or we could have in a lot more comprehensive and uniform way is sort of a, a central data transportation hub where we can see in a comprehensive way what the trends are and how to make policy when those trends are, are butting up against a societal need that we care about. And, you know, when, when I say electric vehicles and bikes are taking off and so are cars, that's because we're pulling information from all different sources and cobbling that together and then we're able to make that statement. But wouldn't it be great if it wasn't that much work? Um, and wouldn't it be that much quicker to get to solutions if we didn't spend so much time figuring out what's going on? And we're, we live in an emotional time in an emotional city where we live very densely you know, together. So not only is it important to make decisions, it's, it's important to understand what you're hearing on the street about what's happening and gauge where it fits in with everything else. So you know, one community may say there's congestion everywhere and another community may say, I've got too many damn bike lanes, right? Like you need some data to be able to figure some of that out as a policymaker. So I think that's an area where we as a city can be better prepared for what's happening now, what will, you know, probably happen in some way, shape or form in the future. Um, we need to be able to know exactly what's going on quickly so we can come up with those quick solutions and changes. Um, and all of that is within the power of the city, right? Like we're a big city, lots of people want to be here. So if that's a fundamental requirement to operate in that city, that you provide a certain amount of relevant data, you know, careful about the privacy concerns, you've provided in a format that that's um, consistent and that um, can be used by multiple agencies, then I think we're all better off. Thank you, thank you. Um, just a last uh, chance for everyone to uh, weigh in here. I just want to throw out the idea that um, technological advancement, new technique and tools and strategies, uh, everyone is all in for that, I think. Everyone, that all sounds good. 
But somehow I think that maybe many of us need to talk about maybe an attitude adjustment to all of this. And I wonder what thoughts about your attitudes towards all this. And it's in the crisis is probably not the time to be looking at one's long-term attitudes towards things because we're all trying to get through the day in different ways. But how's your attitude towards all this? And what do you think about New Yorkers needing an attitude adjustment so we cope a little better? Because as I said earlier, sometimes transformation hurts and is very difficult to, to do. And we sometimes do it kicking and screaming. Uh, and that doesn't help usually. Gordon, what's your thought? You need to uh, unmute again. I think our governor say the best. New York is tough. New York is a tough place. People will adapt and you know, this is probably the best city to adapt anything because you know, no, nothing gonna seem to be surprise anybody, right? Anything that you, know, you put some new policy up, nobody will be surprised because we are just in you know, a place that is always have something strange happen. And I think that's a pretty unique, I think, across a lot of city. We have a different attitude. And I think this attitude is going to help us. And as long as everybody continue to add the attitude. I, I, I think one of the things also, um, in a way, you know, the, the COVID-19, because it happened on us most heavily, and a lot of people talk about it. That's why make us be more ready, right, for the next wave or the third wave or the fifth wave to come. Because of the fact is so much devastation in the beginning. And uh, the entire city have a chance to see firsthand what are happening to us. And I guess if you survive this, you can survive anything. I mean, all changes will be all welcome. I don't think anybody will be close-minded after this such an event. It's like a shock treatment, so to speak. So I think that's, that's you know, we are very fortunate to live in a place that people will have that kind of attitude. Jordan? You know, I think the biggest thing that, you know, I have learned and, and you know, my, my company, Rhino, has learned during, you know, the COVID-19 crisis is, you know, the, the importance of engagement. I think that the private sector and, and innovators, if we want to call folks that who are, who are delivering new solutions, you know, the burden is high and the burden is on us to educate, inform, and collaborate both with the public sector and government, as well as everyday New Yorkers, everyday people uh, everywhere. You know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things about, you know, that I believe about, you know, residents of, of the five boroughs of, of is to, you know, make life uh, smoother, easier, more affordable, uh, and safer. You know, I think that there really is an appetite of folks, as much as people may be used to doing things a certain way, there is an appetite if something does in fact make life better. I think it's just about engagement. You know, I think we need to create opportunities for the public sector and private sector to have open lines of communication and, and understand, you know, what works and how we get it in front of people quickly and as inexpensively and accessibly as possible. Um, so I think that's really kind of one of the reasons I'm optimistic, you know, is that, is that, you know, again, people are open to things if they work and improve life. And I think it's really just about the private sector, you know, really not being shy about getting in front of government officials and people and, and answering tough questions, you know, and, 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 you know, being open to that level of scrutiny, you know, and, and addressing concerns and, and understanding kind of why people may have hesitation. And I think that those solutions that can withstand that uh, stress test of scrutiny and, and critical examination by elected officials uh, and, and people will, will be successful and will be used by people. So that's one of the reasons I'm excited. And that's kind of how I think, you know, the future really, really should be navigated. Really the keys are, you know, like I said, it's, it's engagement and answering the tough questions. Thanks, Mira. Um, I, I go back to, you know, what I think has been said a few times, you know, the, the linkage, we're sort of in this together. So I do think that um, the attitude adjustment is that what you, how somebody else is faring in the city does actually affect how your life. 
And that may manifest itself in a more willingness, you know, willingness to a greater degree for public private partnerships um, for cities that have invested in the city and they want to see the city thrive and, and people to come back to the city and enjoy all of it that it has to offer, even if it's in limited opening capacity right now. Um, but it, it certainly, you know, we get something from every crisis. From Sandy, we have a renewed emphasis on resiliency. Um, but I think from this crisis, you know, beyond the public health ramifications, which I'm sure, you know, the medical community has lots to say there on what will be staying, um, we do have, I think, a level of connectedness that we probably didn't have prior to the pandemic that hopefully will not go away. And I, I think in part, it won't go away. It's good, to, uh, it's good to be with three hopeful, positive people who uh, say sort of transformation, bring it on. So uh, I thank you so much for uh, participating. John, thanks to you and the entire, uh, entire team at City and State. Uh, we are seeing transformation and the hiccups uh, as we go through and uh, Zoom is just one of them, but uh, uh, boy, are we appreciative that we have this way to communicate with each other. So thanks again to you all. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Steve. Uh, thank you to all the panelists. Thanks, Steve. A few final notes before we conclude. We're also hosting a webinar with Pimerang on whether your business payments are safe. That's tomorrow, Wednesday, September 30th from 2 to 3 p.m. Registration is free and on our website. We'll also post it in the chat. On Thursday, October 15th at 1, we have our virtual Protecting New York Summit. Registration is also free and can be found on our event page and cityandstateny.com, also in the chat. And we'd also like to thank again the sponsors of today's webinar, Glenwood Grand Central Partnership, TD Bank, Community Preservation Corporation, New York Building Congress, Fried Frank and Kassir. Thanks to all of our speakers today and thanks to you, our viewers. That concludes our program.